My name is Dr. Chris Winslow. I'm interim director for Ohio Sea Grant and Ohio State Laboratories. Welcome to the island. How many people have been here before? I'm just curious. Ah, all right. See, it's addicting. Once you come up here, you, you can't leave. It's great. Oh, so the way that uh, tonight is set up, every Thursday night throughout the summer, we have our uh, research and guest lecture series. Um, so we have the speakers here. We get to see them face to face, but this is being webcast. Um, so there's people online that are going to be listening to the talks also. The way we start off is, as you can see here, we'll have a research brief. Um, so that will be our first speaker. Runs from right about now to about 8. Um, and then after that, we might give you a little break to kind of walk around, loosen up. Uh, before we get to our guest lecture, I'll go around and kind of ask the professors that are in the room how things are going. I'll get any announcements that we might need to get out of the way. And we'll enter into our, our guest lecture point. Um, so the first person that we have here with us tonight is uh, Dr. Tim Davis. Uh, Tim comes from us from NOAA Glares, Glarel, so the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. It's based out of Ann Arbor. Um, I'm gonna let, I don't want to steal too much of, of Tim's thunder here. I like for the, the speakers to kind of give you an idea of, of where they went in their career. Um, but he does have a, a bachelor's degree that came from what Southampton, in, in South, Southampton College in, in Long Island, right? Yep. Long Island University. And then you also were at SUNY Stony Brook for, for your PhD work. That's correct. And so that's kind of his educational background. But again, I, I, I like for the speakers to kind of talk to you about how they got from where they were in your seat to where they are now. And, and many of you are probably sitting there looking maybe four-year degrees coming here soon, but what's next? And so I think it's refreshing for you to see that sometimes that path isn't straight from bachelor's to career you're going to have for the rest of your life, but it kind of has a crooked route. And so <coughs> these two speakers are going to give you a little insight into how they got to where they're at before they get into the meat of their talk. So I don't want to take too much more of the time, but basically um, using advanced detection methods to understand the drivers of growth and toxicity in cyanohabs in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Everybody can join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Tim Davis. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Winslow. Okay, thank you, Chris, and thank you for everyone uh, for volunteering your time for this mandatory uh, session. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is exactly what you want to be doing on Thursday night in Putin Bay. So, no problem. So, Chris is right. Um, not every path I've is... I've never heard that before. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'll never say it again. <laughs> I have two degrees in marine science, and I study the precious water on our planet. So, um, I, like uh, Chris said, my bachelor's degree is from Southampton College of Long Island University. That no longer exists. Um, it was shut down in 2009, so if you're looking <laughs> for a college, that's not the one. <laughs> uh, I have my PhD from uh, Stony Brook University, and from my PhD, I did my first postdoc in Brisbane, Australia at the Australian Rivers Institute. I was there for two and a half years studying harmful algal blooms in the reservoirs that provide the city of Brisbane, a city of about three million people, uh, with drinking water. Then I came back and decided well, research isn't for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach. And I went to the Inland Seas Education Association. Does anyone, has anyone ever went on that? Oh, does anyone know of it? Two people. All right. So it's a Great Lakes Education um, Association. It's a nonprofit that uses a tall ship to uh, take students out, teach them about the Great Lakes. And I decided teaching is great, but I really like research. And went back and did my second postdoc at Environment Canada <coughs> in uh, Ontario. I was there for a little over a year, and then I took my position at NOAA. So I bounced around a lot. And within that time, uh, my wife and I had three children. So none of which born in the United States, all of which are citizens. So uh, it's been very interesting. So that's kind of my background. Uh, in terms of my position at NOAA, I lead Glural's uh, Heart Global Bloom Program. We have a number of different facets uh, to that program, and I'm going to talk to you today. It's a bit of a bait and switch with my title. I wanted just to get you in the room and then, uh, and then totally switch up what I was going to talk about. But uh, I'm going to really talk about the, my focus, which is the prediction, monitoring, and experiment, trying to understand the drivers of toxicity and HABs in the Great Lakes. So I fully recognize that I don't do all the work myself. Actually, I sit in my office most days and write reports. Um, I have a great team of people uh, that works with me, um, and I collaborate with the University of Michigan, um, my colleagues at NOAA, um, uh, and other parts of NOAA 
and I have Tina and Alicia. Raise your hands. Everyone stare. Um, these are two colleagues that are with me this week, and I'll get into why we're out uh, in Putin Bay this week in, in a little bit. Um, but we collaborate with a number of different universities, including uh, Stone Lab and Environment Canada, and our funding primarily comes from Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as well as uh, some from uh, the Great Lakes Nutrient Initiative, NOAA, and, and University of Michigan. So you always have to make sure to uh, recognize the people that you work with and your funding sources, because without that, you just sit in the desk. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about all the ways algae are bad. So I'd like to start off my presentation by telling you how important algae are to our existence as a species. So while they comprise about 1% of all plant biomass on Earth, they produce about half the oxygen we breathe. Um, most of that comes in, in the form of these, what we call picoplankton, tunicococcus, prochlorococcus, and the world's oceans. They are extremely important to life evolving as we know it. These cyanobacteria were some of the first photosynthesizers. They were the first ones to put oxygen in our atmosphere. If they did not evolve to photosynthesize, we do not exist, and I'm not giving this talk right now. They are the base of most aquatic food webs, so they're very important um, in sustaining fisheries, what we all like to do, commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, um, which is why changes at the base of the food web impact every trophic level above it. They are the ultimate tree huggers. They help fight climate change by taking in carbon dioxide as they photosynthesize, they use carbon dioxide and they turn that into biomass. And when they die, especially in the ocean, they sink down to very deep depths where that carbon is sequestered for a thousand years. So they are taking a lot of the carbon dioxide that we are pumping in the atmosphere and they are sequestering it in the deep layers of the ocean. However, of all the great things algae can do for us, because of human activity, there are instances where algae can become harmful to aquatic ecosystems and to human health. So we have to recognize that our actions are impacting our environment and causing these events to occur. And cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria also known as blue-green algae, we know all about them in the Great Lakes. I'm sure in your classes you've heard them uh, come up before these harmful algal blooms. But this is not a Great Lakes issue. It's a global issue. These uh, events occur in most of Earth's socioeconomically important and large water bodies, such as Lake Tahu in China, uh, Matilda Bay in, Aus in Australia, the Han River in Seoul, South Korea, Lake Okeechobee. Who heard of Lake Okeechobee in the news recently? Yeah. Um, I was down there two weeks ago uh, sampling this bloom, so Lake Okeechobee is making national news. And of course, the African Great Lakes. The African Great Lakes actually hold more water than the Laurentian Great Lakes, although they're not one system like ours are. But Lake Victoria and um, Lake Malawi experience harmful algal blooms. So you have some of the largest lakes on Earth experiencing these blooms, and they are primarily human driven. But cyanobacteria have been on this Earth for billions of years. About two and a half billion years ago, um, cyanobacteria were formed the ability to photosynthesize. What this tells us is that they are excellent survivalists. They know how to utilize their ecosystem in order to survive. And what this figure shows from a, a paper in science from some colleagues of ours um, is how complex their ecology is. We've been studying these blooms for decades. We know a lot about what makes them tick. We don't know a lot about what makes them tick as well. So there's still a lot of ongoing research. So you have, obviously, stormwater runoff coming in, providing nutrients and carbon. You have internal cycling of carbon. You have increased carbon dioxide. You have um, what they don't have here are some of the ways, that, like viral lysis of these populations. Bacterial or bacterial lysis grazing, all of these either promote or constrain the blooms that we see. So their ecology is extremely complex. And even after decades of research, we're still only scratching the first few layers of what we understand about these uh, types of events. And this is an issue because cyanobacterial blooms can cause 
harm to human health, not just aquatic ecosystems. When we talk about harmful algal blooms, we talk about everything that can cause harm to an environment or human health. So the World Health Organization has set a one microgram per liter for a microcystin guideline for safe drinking water. Ohio has a bit of a different set of guidelines. Their guideline for adults is 1.6 micrograms per liter as for a 10-day exposure that was implemented after the Toledo incident. Cytotoxins can also cause serious neurological and gastrointestinal disorders. And on occasion, these compounds have led to deaths in humans, never in the United States. But in Brazil, um, hemodialysis patients were treated with microcystin contaminated water, and of the 100 or so that were treated, about half died. So they can cause deaths. But generally, what we see in the United States is deaths in waterfowl, cattle, dogs, and marine mammals. So you have a freshwater toxin making its way into a marine environment. And this paper from 2010 demonstrated that nicely. So there was a bloom in Pinto Lake in California. That bloom was flushed down into the Monterey Bay uh, Marine Reserve. Uh, and these southern sea otters that are listed as federally threatened species, what happened was the bloom came down, the bivalves in that marine estuary filtered everything, because that's what they do, that's how they eat, they filter all the algae, they concentrate all the microcystin, and what do otters eat? They eat bivalves, these clams, and they ended up perishing, so they had 21 deaths. So this was the first real um, evidence of these freshwater toxins impacting a marine threatened species. And of course, I'm required by law to talk about the Toledo water crisis, <laughs> so I will do that now. Of course, everyone should be familiar with this event if you're sitting in this room. Some of you were probably even impacted by this event um, a, a couple of years ago. I want to point out that that's not the first time something like this has happened in Lake Erie. Carroll Township uh, experienced a very similar issue in 2013. However, these types of events occur all around the world. So you have the Wuxi water crisis of 2007. This is a city of 1.4 million people. They had a drinking water crisis where they could not drink their water. This is on Lake Tahu. And they draw their water directly from Lake Tahu. They could not drink their water for seven days. But the economic ramifications lasted longer than that. The entire city now is weary of using their tap water, so they drink bottled water. Most people in the city drink bottled water, which is a huge expense. It's also really bad for the environment. You have the Lake Okeechobee state of emergency that just happened a couple weeks ago, where a bloom in Lake Okeechobee got flushed down the St. Lucie River and ended up in the Indian River Lagoon, another freshwater to marine uh, uh, connection. And while it didn't necessarily impact human health that we know of, it did impact economics, because this occurred over the 4th of July weekend. And when we were down there, we talked to one organization that said they were boat rental. To last year during the 4th of July, they did $50,000 in sales. This year, they did four, less than four. So that was one organization. Uh-oh. Something went wrong. Anyway, I'll keep talking. Oh, never mind. Never mind the curtain. So, <laughs> and this bloom actually made it out the estuary mouth and ended up washing up on ocean beaches. So this sign right here, the picture I took of an advisory, this leads out to the Atlantic Ocean. There was cyanobacteria all along the coast, so huge economic ramifications. And finally, maybe not finally. Anyway, and who heard of the uh, Utah Lake? Um, anyone here of Utah Lake? 90% of that lake, uh, just a couple weeks ago, was covered in blue-green algal bloom. The, uh, the disease uh, center for Utah had, we good to go? Yeah, there we are. Utah Poison Control. It took hundreds of calls. And they reported about 130 people likely, in, but likely came in contact with the water reporting vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, rashes. This, these are all common symptoms when you come in contact with a cyanobacterial uh, bloom. So 90% of Utah Lake was covered in a bloom. Now the press probably homed in on the worst part. Not all of it was probably like this. But just this summer, we've had two instances within two weeks of each other 
where large lakes have been experiencing these blooms and have social, economic, and human health impacts. So why have, ha why have these events proliferated? What we, what we see, why, why do they seem like they're getting worse? Well, one, it's anthropogenic, and that's just a fancy word for human nutrient loading. We're adding more nutrients to our system. That is a, a fact that is undeniable. We're losing key food web predators, not necessarily in the Great Lakes, but in our coastal environment. The bivalve, everything that we like to eat, everyone likes to eat oysters on the half shell, clams on the half shell. I refuse to eat those because I'm tainted, but when you take those out of the system, they aren't able to do their job, which is filter the water. So it promotes algal blooms. Invasive species in many systems have promoted algal blooms, and even potentially in Lake Erie, the quagga and zebra mussel uh, may have contributed to the blooms we see today. Global climate change, of course, is something that is most likely making blooms worse. These sound bacteria blooms like warm water. So if you increase the air temperature, you will increase the water temperature. And finally, we can't also deny that we are looking for them harder. So not all of this can be related back to the environmental factors. We are looking much harder these days because we know that there are problems. So some of it just has to come from the fact that we are looking. So in the Great Lakes, I've, I've taken it from a world view, now I'm going to boil it down to the Great Lakes. We have algal blooms, whether it's cyanobacteria or Clodophora. Clodophora is a green algae. It tends to form uh, on the bottom, and they actually occur in places that are fairly oligotrophic or don't have many nutrients, at least in the water column, such as uh, northern Michigan. We get them in eastern uh, Lake, Ontario, or Lake Erie. Uh, we get them on northern Lake Ontario. But we also have cyanobacteria blooms occurring all five of the Great Lakes, even though we talk a lot about Lake Erie. These blooms are a basin-wide issue. And when we come back down to Lake Erie, we have three main bloom-forming species. The blooms we see in the harbor here and out in the lake are generally formed of microcystis. The blooms that occur in Sandusky Bay and the Maumee River, they generally are planktothrix. These two organisms produce microcystin. And before microcystin was given its official name, it was known as fast death factor. So just to give you an idea of, of the potency. Anabena tends to form in blooms in the central basin of Lake Erie. Now, this organism can produce anatoxin A, which before it was known as antoxin A was known as very fast death factor. It's a neurotoxin um, and uh, is, is very potent. The anabana blooms that form in Lake Erie, we have not detected anatoxin associated with those blooms, uh, but we don't have very good data. It's very spotty, so we need to go back, and that's something that Justin is, is with some uh, funding through Ohio Sea Grant um, and his team, they are uh, keeping a much closer eye on those uh, central basin blooms. So Glural, what is our overarching research statement? Well, we want to understand the drivers of bloom ecology, and that will aid in enhancing predictive models that will be able to forecast bloom size, location, as well as toxicity. This is one of our gold, uh, our gold standards, to be able to predict toxicity, right? Being able to predict size and location is very important, and we can do that now. But forecasting toxicity is something we cannot do yet because we don't understand the control as well as we need to. So at Gluro, we take an integrated approach to studying halves. We use genetics. We study invasive species. We use real-time monitoring observations. We use satellites and other forms of remote sensing. And we use advanced technologies, such as the environmental sample processor, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And all of those combine into the products that we produce. And two current ones are the Bulletin, the bi, or the twice weekly bulletin that's produced. Does, that, does anyone subscribe to that? Not in the research community. <laughs> so a few people. If you really want to keep up to speed on what's going on, sign up for this. You can do that through the Glural website. And on the Glural website, we have our HAB tracker, which is a uh, animation of where the bloom is moving and what the biomass, um, how the biomass is changing, or how dense it is. So the dark, the warmer colors in red here are the denser areas of the bloom. The lighter colors are the uh, less dense areas of the bloom. So it runs in five-day uh, segments, and it gets updated every time we get a new satellite image. So the bulletin and the hab track are two very useful tools. But we just don't study 
harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. We have sampling programs in Saginaw Bay. We collaborate with Environment and Climate Change Canada um, to study Lake Sinclair, the southern shore, which is where they tend to see their microcystis blooms, and of course, Western Lake Erie. I'm going to focus most of my talk on Western Lake Erie because we're in the middle of Western Lake Erie. So um, I figure most people care about that more than, um, let's say, Lake Sinclair or Saginaw Bay, but I'm happy to speak with uh, others about those programs later. And in Lake Erie, we know cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms are increasing in severity. So we started to see blooms back reappear uh, in the mid-90s. And since we've been able to uh, put in a cyanobacterial index about 2002, we've noticed that um, over the past uh, 12, 13 years, you see a constant trend. There is some variation, and that's normal, but it's a constant trend, especially since 2011, which was the largest bloom in history until last year, which surpassed that. Um, it actually broke our scale. We were only were able to go up to a 10, and that was a 10.5. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie Spinal Tap, but we need to turn that up to an 11. Um, <laughs> So, uh, which we're working on. Um, so these are our partners at NOAA um, uh, Coastal Ocean Sciences. Um, the National Ocean Service put out this uh, severity index. But they're getting worse. These, these blooms are getting bigger. Now, of course, I say that in this year's predicted to be a more mild bloom, but that we can talk about why that is later. But overall, we are seeing a trend up, which is never good, unless it's your bank account. We monitor eight sites around the western base of Lake Erie, and not one group cannot, cannot sample the entire basin. So we study these sites, and we, we're out weekly, and we collect grab samples at the surface and at bottom at some of these sites. We have continuous uh, monitoring at four of our sites, eight, four, two, and 13. Our partners at USGS, um, the uh, Michigan Science Center, they're sampling the northwestern portion of uh, Lake Erie. Um, Justin and uh, his team are sampling the eastern side of the western basin of Lake Erie. And then Tom Bridgman and his group at University of Toledo are also sampling the southern shore and some of the areas that we're not getting in the western basin. And, of course, George Bullerjarn and uh, Mike McKay and their team are looking at the blooms in Saginaw Bay. Justin's down there sampling as well. So as a collective uh, body, we are able to actually sample quite a bit of the Western Basin. Um, and of course, you know, the Canadian waters, we let them deal with. But Environment and Climate Change Canada do sample whenever they can get over there. So our real-time stations, these red stars, we have currently deployed a uh, DTD, so we have these SONs that really give us general water quality, temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, some pigments, some in situ or in the water pigments, chlorophyll, which is a proxy for all algal biomass, phycocyanin, which is specific to cyanobacteria. So we are getting these in near real time. We have wet labs, uh, cyclo P, which gives us inorganic phosphorus <coughs> concentrations, and inorganic phosphorus is one of the main ingredients driving these blooms. It's what um, we measure in terms of uh, predicting bloom severity. And we have uh, nitrate sensors. Nitrogen is also extremely important in promoting bloom size and bloom toxicity, which we'll get into in a little bit. So we have these instruments deployed at four of our sites. One thing we don't do very well is monitor toxicity. Because we only can get toxin samples when we go out and classify both, we can only get them at a week-to-week -week basis. And while that's okay, we can learn a lot from a seasonal sample. If we want to develop models, we need much more frequent measurements and accurate measurements of bloom toxicity. So I'm going to talk about Mars. <laughs> the Viking missions to Mars were the first time a biological probe was used to search for life outside this planet. The technology that we're working with today um, right here at Stone Lab, in a, in a shed right, on, uh, right outside the wet lab, is essentially the great-great-grandchild of the Viking probe. 
It was developed at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. It took about 20 years and around $20 million to develop this technology to what we can use today. But it is called the environmental sample processor. We refer to it as a lab in a can. And this was purchased with Great Lakes Restoration Funds post the Toledo water crisis to improve our ability to monitor toxins in the Western Basin and give early warning to the city of Toledo if toxins were coming their way. Um, so this, was, this uh, unit um, can do that. This is a collaboration between NOAA, um, MBARI, which is Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and of course Ohio State University, which is why we're here. Um, this is emerging technology. There's, 20, there's less than 20 of these instruments worldwide. And if you want one, it's only five easy payments of $75,000. <laughs> but there's more. It comes with a free buoy if you order in the next five minutes. ESP Niagara is what we named our environmental sample processor. What it does, and I'll show you a little video and I'll walk through it, but we have it, we're designing it right now to be able to um, monitor uh, toxicity remotely. So we deploy this in this lander and we actually submerge it to the bottom of Lake Erie and we have a buoy that goes to the surface. And we can either take samples at the surface or at the top, this little uh, area right up here, we can take samples at depth, which is about the depth of water intakes. And it will take a sample, concentrate it, extract it, analyze it, and send us back the data remotely. So it's a grad student that you never have to feed and it doesn't complain. <laughs> so I will hopefully be able to start this video. This little animation kind of gives you an idea. So this is where inside, this is the guts of the environmental sample processor. A arm inside it moves and takes a puck. This is a puck, I'll pass this around if you'd like to take a look at it after the video. We take water and we filter it through this puck and concentrate it. Then we use heat and pressure and some chemical reagents to extract it. Then we move another puck. Well, we, it, the ESP moves another puck. We add the extract. We add um, our reagents. A chemical reaction takes place. It's called uh, enzyme-linked mutinosorbent assay. And then it gets put under a special camera. It takes a picture. This is what we get. And then Tina, raise your hand again, will analyze it in South Carolina because she gets that in, she gets that image instantly once it's taken and uploaded. And within 10 to 15 minutes, we can have that online. So the entire process from sample collection to uh, our data being put up online is roughly two and a half to three hours. This machine can hold um, 120 of these pucks. I'll pass the other one around. Do not steal this. This is titanium. Uh, and I know how many I've given out. <laughs> Alicia will come after you. Um, we can keep this instrument out for, if we sample every other day, we can keep it out for 80 days, which spans the entire balloon season. And it will give us toxin levels, either at the surface or at depth, every other day, which is a significant improvement over the current strategy that we have now, which is weekly. We could sample every day. We could sample every four hours. We can do whatever we want, but we have a limited number of these pucks. So the pucks are where the science takes place. As soon as we run out of those, we have to go get the instrument. And this is what it looks like. So these pictures, this is what Tina will get um, when the machine takes a picture. And as you can see, these bright controls here, these three dots, and these four right here are controls. This tells us the assay is working. And then as you can see, as we increase in microcystic concentration, these other spots gets suppressed. The way that the assay works is that it suppresses, um, it's, a, it's a competitive ELISA, I won't go into it right now, but basically once we get too high concentration, um, the spots no longer show up, so that's when we know that we're outside of our standard range. So it does take a little bit of finessing to make sure that we stay within our standard curve, but that's like any assay. And this is our lander. Um, it's about six feet or five and a half feet tall. It has a five by five footprint and it was developed at the uh, University of Washington Applied Physics Lab, and they designed it to be able to withstand a Hurricane Sandy coming through Lake Erie. Because our instrument cannot tip over, if our instrument tips over some of the reagents, all of our waste is stored in the bottom of this. It could flush back up into our instrument. It could leak. It could 
contaminate, where it could flood our instruments, and of course electronics and water don't mix. So we want to keep this thing upright at all costs. These are our battery powers, these towers right here. They each hold 200 D-cell batteries, and that's what this machine runs off of. So 400 D-cell batteries. Um, and of course, what we're doing this year is we have, we did a uh, engineering deployment early June, make sure we can actually deploy this and get it up um, out of the water. Right now, with the help of Ohio State and Stone Lab, um, we're doing our science test to test the ethics. We've been taking samples all week, um, working 12, 14 hour days uh, to, to collect as much data as possible. And then this September will be the first full mission in Lake Erie. So we'll be deploying this in Lake Erie, hopefully this September, and be able to start collecting data. Hopefully. I look at my team and they're scared. But um, this is a very powerful piece of technology. But because we don't have the best data doesn't mean we can't learn something from the data that we already have. So our weekly sampling, um, it allows us to see potential drivers of bloom toxicity and growth, and that allows us to inform future experiments. So for example, I'll walk you through this uh, figure. We see toxicity change. So this is toxicity. This is phycocyanin. This is a proxy for, al for, phyco or for blue green algal biomass. And what we see is early in the season, when we have a spike in biomass, we have a spike in toxicity. Later in the season, though, when we have a spike in biomass, we don't see that corresponding spike in toxicity. Why is that? It's an interesting question that we need to answer. There seems to be a relationship between nitrate and bloom toxicity. Um, as you see nitrate decrease, you see bloom toxicity decrease. Well, is that just correlative? Because you can have things that they match up, but that doesn't mean they're connected. So we have to see if we can conduct experiments to look at that connectivity. We have microcystis blooms occur even when phosphorus concentrations are really low, right? Who here has heard that phosphorus concentrations are driving these blooms? Increased phosphorus. So who here thinks that microcystis should be able to survive if there's no phosphorus in the water? Exactly. So we see phycocyanin concentrations even when soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations are very low. How, how are they able to survive during those times? How are the biomass continuously being able to uh, maintain itself because these are very high. This is 40 micrograms per liter. That's pretty high. And of course, there are other factors that may be contributing, such as hydrogen peroxide concentrations. I won't talk about this today because I don't have time, but we just can't look at nutrients. We have to look at other factors as well. And this, I won't go through this uh, just for sake of time, but there are trends between years that we see. So this isn't just a year phenomenon and we don't see it again. We see these trends year to year, so it helps us to understand that there seems to be a uh, correlation, there seems to be a connection, so what kind of experiments can we do to test that? And the way that we do that is we use advanced molecular techniques. So this is called quantitative PCR. Not every cell that's in the bloom out in Lake Erie can produce toxins. There are some that have the genetic capability to produce toxins, and there are some that can't. They just don't have the genetic components, but they look identical. You cannot tell the difference if you look at them underneath the microscope. The only way you can tell the difference is by looking at their genetics. So what we can do is we can sample water. We can use our techniques to look at what portion of the total cyanobacterial community is made up of microcystis. And this is a toxic and non-toxic strain. I don't know about you, but I can't make out the difference um, visually. So then we look at a gene within the uh, necessary genes to produce the toxin, and we're able to look at the potentially toxic versus the non-toxic, or the ones that cannot produce toxin. And that gives us our percent toxic microcystis. So that's a very powerful method that we use um, to understand what portion of the population can actually produce toxins, because that's very important when it comes to bloom toxicity. We also use omics, and omics is a fancy word, but what does that mean? Well, every cell has DNA, RNA, which produce proteins. So you have transcription of DNA to get RNA. You have RNA that's translated into proteins. If we look at DNA, it's called genomics. If we look at the DNA of a single organism, it's the genome, right, the human genome. If we look at the DNA of an entire community, it's called a metagenome. And of course, the same thing applies for RNA. 
all the genes that are being expressed, all the ones that they're actively using, <coughs> will be in the transcriptome. So if we look at it for a single organism, it's a, it's a transcriptome. If we look at it for a multiple organism, it's a metatranscriptome. So we use this because looking at single genes is interesting, but it gives us a limited view of what's going on. Looking at a global picture of how the community is responding to certain events gives us a much better understanding of what we need to do and how those events are affecting the community. Because we just don't want to understand the gene. We want to understand the community. And what this comes down to is we're able to take these phycocyanin concentrations and break them down into different classes of cyanobacteria. So what this shows us, which is really interesting, is that we have one OTU, which stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit. We essentially have one OTU of microcystis dominating the entire year, which is incredible because you have changing environmental conditions from early bloom <coughs> to late bloom to post bloom, but you have one OTU that dominates. And we have other organisms that dominate with, such as Sudanabane, which is another potential microcystin producer that kind of hangs on to the microcystis colonies. So genetics allows us to look at this and look at the changes in proportion. Then all this white space is the non-cyanobacterial uh, uh, bacterial community. Um, it's a little, but basically what this is, is this is all the heterotrophic bacteria. And those populations are extremely important for system function and, e and uh, ecosystem services. And what we see is that the blooms change that bacterial community structure from early bloom to late bloom, pre-bloom, post-bloom. And what we see is that the, the, when these organisms photosynthesize, they change the pH. They actually drive the pH up. And what that's doing is that is causing a shift in bacteria that can tolerate higher pHs. So they're changing that pac the bacterial structure of the bloom, but systems are re resilient. We see that as the pre-bloom, before the bloom occurs, and the post-bloom, these communities are merging, which tells us that even though the cyanobacterial blooms create a short-term disturbance in these communities, the lake is resilient. It will bounce back to its original community, which is really uh, interesting and also somewhat hopeful when we look at long-term restoration. We also see, remember that percent toxic microcystis? Well, we look at these changes in microcystin concentrations along with nitrate and phosphate. And what we see is pretty stark. In the toxic microcystis, we see that they dominate early in the bloom. They, they are more than half. The toxic strains make up more than half of the total microcystis population. But as nitrogen and phosphorus decrease, or at least nitrogen, in this case, phosphorus increases, but nitrogen and toxicity decrease, in this large portion, we see it go from 63 to less than 4%. So that's a huge community shift. So even though we have one OTU, the strains within that are changing. And that is changing our structure of our community and our bloom toxicity. So that's really important to know. And some of the work that Justin has been doing and I've been helping him analyze is conducting experiments. So we saw this. Now we want to go back and see, well, if we, take a, if we take a late season bloom and we incubate it with increased nitrogen, what happens to the genes that are used to produce microcystin? And what we see is after four hours, just after four hours of exposure to increased ammonium, which is the most readily available form of nitrogen, one they like to suck up real fast, you see an increase in bloom toxicity. Or you see an increase in uh, uh, gene expression, which also correlates to increased uh, toxicity. And then after 48 hours, no matter what form of nitrogen you give them, they're <coughs> ramping up their genes, which means they're, they're getting ready to make more toxins. So this is really important because within two days, you can have an increase in toxicity, even in a bloom that is nitrogen starved. So this is a very, very important. It, it's adding to the uh, to the thought that when we look at controlling nutrients, we just can't focus on phosphorus. We have to focus on nitrogen as well. It has to be a dual nutrient strategy 
or else we may reduce the size of the bloom, but we may not reduce the toxicity of the bloom. And then, of course, in other places, if this isn't just into the Western Basin, we see this in Sandusky Bay. These bottles, I was going to put up another figure, but I'm like, forget it, I'm just going to put up a picture. This control, these control bottles, we add phosphorus, nitrate by itself, or nitrate with phosphate. This is after 48 hours of incubation. That is a huge community shift. We saw chlorophyll concentrations double, toxicities double within 48 hours. And that's really important from a management strat from a management point of view. Because if you're with a water intake and you can see your bloom toxicity double within 48 hours after a rainfall and a flush of nitrogen into your system, well, that's really important to know. And we'll go into this ecotranscriptomic surveys. So remember what I said before, microcystis is very good at surviving. It survives in very low phosphorus concentrations. So what we did is we partnered with Environment Canada on their research vessel Limnos, and we did a transect from the mouth of the Maumee Bay, which is where most of the nutrients in the Western Basin come from, all the way out to the islands. And we used metatranscriptomics to understand the bloom response. So here is inorganic phosphorus concentration at each one of these stations. So going from seven at the mouth all the way up to the island, here's what you see. Microcystis does not dominate near the mouth of Maumee. That's not surprising. We know that. But as you move away from the mouth, you see microcystis dominating. Also, you see phosphorus concentrations decreasing almost into the center of the bloom. Now, this is late August, early September, so we expect to see these low phosphorus concentrations, but at one of our sites, it was below detection limit. Well, we still see microcystis dominating, and we see it at high biomass. So what's going on? Well, as it turns out, microcystis is extremely good at scavenging phosphorus. It upregulates its genes to catch any phosphorus it possibly can. These are all of their phosphorus scavenging genes, not all of them, but most of the phosphorus uptake genes uh, for inorganic phosphorus, and they are screaming high. They are really cranking out these genes, which means of even of all the other organisms that are out there, microcystis blows them away far and above. So they are very good at scavenging nitro or, or scavenging phosphorus. So they can survive at low phosphorus. If they get a pulse of nitrogen, they can increase their toxicity. So they are very good survivalists. And what this comes down to is it kind of gives us an idea of what's controlling these blooms. So we have soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations, inorganic nitrogen concentrations, low to high, low to high. And what we see is if you have high phosphorus, high nitrogen, you're going to get misassemblage with elevated toxicity. But if we only deal with phosphorus, well, we may not necessarily, we'll see a decrease in bloom size, but we will not necessarily see a decrease in bloom toxicity. So um, it's very important as we go into the future that we focus on both phosphorus and nitrogen in our management strategies. But what it comes down to is that everything has limitations, right? All of our studies have limitations. And right now, we don't have any available genome for microcystis from the Great Lakes. So uh, my, my postdoc at uh, University of Michigan, we extracted and we analyzed the genome of microcystis from the Great Lakes. And I'm running out of time, but, which maybe something's excited. Um, however, what we found is that basically microcystis in the Great Lakes has a lot of unique genes. They have a lot of genes that we don't see in microcystis strains anywhere else in the world. And this is really important because it doesn't negate the findings that we've seen in the past, but it says that microcysts in the Great Lakes could be doing a lot more that we don't know about because we've been using other strains to analyze our data. So it's really important that we use Great Lakes strains and Great Lakes genetics to analyze Great Lakes samples. That's basically what this comes down to. And so finally, because i got um, about two minutes left, or question, what are the future directions? So I've kind of told you where we're at and where we're going. Well, one of our future directions is that one ESP in, in Western Lake Erie is a good proof of concept. We're hoping to develop a network of these to have an early warning detection system 
throughout the Western Basin to, um, to enhance the weekly monitoring that I'm doing, that Justin's doing, that USGS is doing, Tom Bridgman is doing. So that's one of our hopes is to be able to show the value of these machines and, uh, and create a network. We want to further develop the ESP capability. It's a very powerful instrument. It, does, it, is, it just doesn't analyze toxins but it can analyze multiple toxins. It can look at, it can run molecular assays to look at organism presence. It can archive samples so we can take it back to lab and do things with them later. We can analyze them later. Um, so they are very powerful machines. We're gonna continue working with Justin, uh, the folks from Bowling Green State University, to investigate the ecological adaptations of Great Lakes strains. We wanna understand the interactive roles of light, nutrients, temperature, and toxin production. That's some of what Justin and his team and, and we're, we're, we're collaborating on is because increased nutrients, if we do nothing, if the status quo remains, we're gonna see increased nutrients, warmer waters, potentially higher carbon dioxide concentrations. How do those interact with each other? Because they're not gonna happen in bubbles. How do those interact with each other to an impact of blooms in Lake Erie and elsewhere in the Great Lakes and throughout the world? Um, and of course, we wanna understand how change the microsystem continent. So different types of microsystems have different toxicities and there are over 90 different types of microsystems. So how do those change over the course of a bloom? And we're working with Environment Can on that. And then of course, we wanna take our understanding of what's happening in Lake Erie and the Great Lakes and apply that to other places in the world. So we're working with some of our Chinese colleagues outside of Shanghai to, uh, to see if uh, the findings that we see in Lake Erie can be applied to their systems or if they have different control on their blooms because their system is different, it's possible. We are working in Lake Okeechobee with uh, our folks from um, Stony Brook uh, University to see what's driving bloom toxicity and growth in Lake Okeechobee versus the North American Great Lakes, so a subtropical versus a temperate system. So all of these. And then finally, with the ESP, we are working on the microcystin assay, but Tina uh, is gonna help us work on um, to being able to develop a multiplex so we can look at three different toxins, microcystins, saxitoxins, and salinospermopsins, all in the same assay. So that will be a very powerful assay because we can not just look at microcystins, but look at three different types of toxins. And finally, we want to take our ESP technology and use other emerging technologies, such as the th third generation environmental sample processor, which is mobile. They've shrunk it down to be able to put on an AUV so that we can fly it and we can move it around the basin. So hopefully we can um, use our 2G ESP in conjunction with the third generation, um, as well as some of the newer technologies coming out, such as the MBio WaveGlide, which is in a prototype phase, which is a portable um, unit that fishermen, it's, it's a simple workflow, portable unit um, that fishermen, uh, park rangers, uh, citizen scientists can use to help us better monitor because all of these technologies will come together and help us be able to develop more uh, accurate and uh, um, more accurate predictive models for bloom toxicity, which is the next goal that NOAA GLURL is working towards. Um, we, can, we can model bloom size, location, but we need to work on toxicity. And in order to do that, we need better, better and more frequent measurements. And with that, I'll take any questions. Absolutely. So we have colleagues down in Australia who are, who are working on metabolomics uh, right now on microcystis and other types of cyanobacteria, one step at a time. So we want to, we're moving from genomics to transcriptomics. We want to move into proteomics and then eventually metabolomics. So all of those combined really go from the gene to the product and how they're using that product. So yes, absolutely. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I saw on one of your slides um, that you had uh, CRISPR Cas9 in there. Is that a thought for gene editing of microcystis? Yeah, so I didn't get to talk about yeah. that because I was running out of time. Basically, the unique genes that we're finding in microcystis in the Great Lakes generally have to do with uh, flexible, uh, their, their ability to change their genome quite rapidly. So transposases, the CRISPR Cas, 
so they can edit and rearrange their genome. And some other studies uh, from colleagues at uh, University of Tennessee have found that based on their nutrient status, they may rearrange their genome to help them better survive in very short order. So that's one of the issues with microcystis, that it's constantly rearranging its genome, kicking things out, bringing things in. So it's, these, like I said, these cyanobacteria bacteria are survivalists. They will do what they need to do to survive, and one of them is being able to rearrange and modify their genome based on the environmental conditions they're seeing at that time. Okay. So they're really cool organisms, to a certain degree. <laughs> So, so after a bloom finishes its cycle, synapses, you know, rest at the bottom in a resting stage. Yep. That's going to see the next year's bloom, right? And so, normally you see a certain up until last year we saw a certain level of toxicity that was kind of associated with bloom. So for a while we thought you know, if you have this size bloom, you're going to have this amount of toxicity. Last year kind of broke that rule. We were like 25% less toxic than we would have predicted based on the size. Right. So with that group of cells that are sinking that should have the strains that are less toxic, right? There should be less strains down there that have the full gene complex to produce the gene. I was kind of hoping that this year we would always now see less toxic blooms relative to the size of the bloom. Do you have any thoughts on how that might play into this year yet? Right. So, and that, that's, a, that's a good point. So, last year's bloom, it was, it, it was a low toxicity year. But there three factors that play into bloom toxicity. One is that toxic microcystis ratio. Two is the strains that can produce toxin, are they up or down regulating their genes? Three, what types of microcystin are they producing? All of those play into overall bloom toxicity. Just because we don't have a lot of them. So last year, according to our QPCR, you know, we did see times when they were 100%, but they were very low populations. But they were really around 25 to 30 percent of the population. We're still looking into understanding why, but it may just be that they were downregulating their genes. So also, when that bloom senesces and dies, falls to the bottom, in the spring when you have high nutrients again and fairly clear water like we do in normal years, toxic strains of microcystis tend to do well during those times. So even though they're only 30 percent at the end of the year, well, once they get back into the water column, they, can, they may be able to outcompete the non-toxic strains. So just because they're only 1%, because, for example, uh, at the end of 2014, they were only, they were less than 4% of the, of, the, of, of the percent uh, total population with toxic strains. So, right, but it depends on the environmental condition, which strain is going to dominate. So if you get the right conditions, the toxic strains are just going to grow and proliferate, whether they're one percent or ten percent. Yes. How does vapor moth get into all this? That's a great question, and it's one that is still I open to to a certain degree. But a lot of people don't recognize that Lake Erie has bloomed since the 60s and 70s, right? The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972. Um, before that, Lake Erie was experiencing a <coughs> wild bloom and hypoxia, but the blooms were dominated by different organisms. It was two, a couple different types of cyanobacteria, aphanosomnon and abano, with the microcystis. Well, lo and behold, 1972 water quality uh, agreement, Great Lakes, um, uh, the, well, the Clean Water Act, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement come into play. They really do a great job of cleaning up the lake. Lake Erie is hailed as a, by the mid-80s, a beacon of lake restoration, right, ecosystem restoration. Well, we said, fixed and stop monitoring. In that time, zebra mussels came in. They became established, and in the mid-90s, we started seeing blooms that were primarily dominated by microcystis. So zebra mussels likely had an impact there, but because we don't have the monitoring data, we don't really know that 100%. How they play into blooms right now is also a bit iffy because as the water temperatures get too warm, they will shut down their feeding. Right, so there's the blooms come into play right at the time that quagga or quagga and zebra mussels are. Right now, it's mainly quaggas out there because they displace all the zebras, but they're shutting down their their feeding ability. So can can they be a control in the blooms? Maybe in the fall, but when the water temperatures get too warm, they just stop feeding. They just uh, go kind of dormant. So historically, long term, they probably played a role in allowing the blooms that we see today to occur. 
but currently, you know, can they feed on toxic microcystis? Some studies say yes, some studies say no. So there's, there's conflicting results, and the bottom line is we just need to really understand more of, more of that, but um, unfortunately I can't give you a clean cut answer at this point. What's the status of the open lake disposal of dredging spoils from the western basin harbors, and is it no longer allowed, and does it have any connection to either the water issue in Toledo or to the more recent algal blooms, or is it an unrelated issue? I don't know too much about that, um, so I can't. I, Chris, do you know much about? The, I don't. I don't know if the dredging still going on, or if that's been. <coughs> yes, yeah, so the dredging is the open lake disposal of the dredging. Yeah. So it's there all is, there land based is, uh, holding. Yes, but on confinement, so in, in, in Chris, you can probably speak on a little bit when, when yeah, you're up yeah, too. Yeah, but that. as far as looking at the dumping of the dredge when it occurred, studies were done. One was contracted by a group called Limnotech based mm -hmm. out of Ann Arbor, and there will be some resuspension of the nutrient phosphorus, but not enough to be driving the bloom. Explain, yeah. No, it's definitely not driving the bloom. Anytime yeah. you get phosphorus in there, it's going to add to the bloom, but it's clearly that's not putting that ban in place and never doing it again mm -hmm. doesn't mean minimal. It didn't have a connection to Toledo either. Toledo, that oh, was interesting. Okay. Yeah, that was an that was an event in Maui. It happened after the dredging. Well, it's in litigation again. Our next people can touch on it. Uh, but basically, the Toledo Dredging Authority issued a letter saying that they were going to in discussions with the Army Corps of Engineering right now. I'm glad Chris is here to talk about that. Plan. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we have time for uh, one more question then. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, I'm sorry if I already mentioned this, but based on the information you know, like right now, I know there's tons of research to be done and stuff, what would be the, what would be in your opinion the best way to sort of stop or just get these back in check? That, that's actually a really great question because um, there's a lot of different opinions on this. One, uh, right now, for example, there's the George Barley Water Prize, which is a $10 million prize that's the handed out by the uh, Everglades, uh, it's being managed by the Everglades Foundation, but it's to reduce um, phosphorus concentrations in lakes, but also be able to take that phosphorus and uh, be able to repurpose the phosphorus that's in the lakes on farm fields. What it comes down to in the Great Lakes and other large systems is that these short-term Band-Aid um, uh, methods for removing either the cells, the toxins, or the nutrients don't work. We need large-scale, basin-wide nutrient remediation efforts, and that comes down to um, from farm fields and cities all the way to lake. You know, it, it takes um, scientists being able to give farmers uh, best management practices, and we go through something called adaptive management, where we take the current science and we try to use the current science in order to develop um, best management practices and target loads. So target loads for phosphorus right now is a 40% reduction. And we work with that. We work to reduce phosphorus concentration down to those levels, which based on our current models should reduce the size and severity of the bloom. But the surefire way is to reduce phosphorus and nitrogen from our system. Right now we can't really put a target on nitrogen because we just don't have the type of information that we do for phosphorus, which is why a lot of the um, plants focus primarily on phosphorus. But as we begin to recognize nitrogen is important, there's a lot more studies going on into the nitrogen cycle um, and also nitrogen um, uh, loads. Where are they coming from? Because phosphorus is mainly just terrestrial. But nitrogen, 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. Some of these plant bacteria can fix that nitrogen. They can use that nitrogen, right? So there are many different avenues that nitrogen can come in. But for the Great Lakes, we have to reduce phosphorus, nitrogen. And that is what we need to do, and that's basically what the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Clean Water Act did from the point sources back in the 70s, and it worked. So we have a good example of how that can work for point sources. It's more difficult for now point sources, but not impossible. It doesn't look like there's much medical will to do anything other than voluntary prescription to farmers and other non sources. Um, is there any chance of that change? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I guess no. Uh, I, I'll, uh, but I, so we we 
we work with them. And I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think there is. But it comes down to, you know, we can't just pass legislation willy-nilly, right? Because whenever we do, it impacts people, bottom line, right? Because we don't want to paint farmers as these evil people that just sit there with their hordes of phosphorus, you know, <laughs> willing to sprinkle it out whenever they need to. You know, it, it's, a, it's a cost to them, right? So, and also every time rules or laws get put in place, you know, they have to change practices. It, it's a cost. Not that, you know, if something comes up that should be done, at, by all means, you know, as a scientist, I believe it should. Um, but it's, I guess it's, and some people probably hate this answer, and this is definitely government speak, but it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we recognize that. Well, but it's possible to put a phosphorus tax on and raise that cost and, and change the behavior, but that doesn't go down very well from the place of the There's many different ways that we can, can do that, but I think the best way that we, that we have and we found is working with the farmers to show them, you know, hey, these methods that we're developing um, and that our academic collaborators are developing, they work. You can use less phosphorus. You can save money. It's more money in your pocket. You get the same amount of crop. So it's worth it. And that's what they see. I mean, they're, they're businessmen first and foremost. They need to feed their family. So how can they produce and be able to – and we have a growing human population, so we need more food, right? So it there's – It seems like that strategy is more effective applications on cropland than it is on CAFO, large concentrated animal operations with the livestock manure, where you're trying to get rid of the stuff. And it's not a good cause to have it stack up. I so totally I think agree. that, that you but know, one size doesn't fit all of these. Absolutely. And that's what makes really it need to that's what makes really really CAFO. Yep, absolutely. No, but 88% of the phosphorus is inorganic phosphorus. Only 12% comes from the CAFOs. The CAFOs are red herring when it comes to this that people keep dwelling on. They're bad for other reasons, but not in this. And, and just speaking yeah. of this, some of the things that have to happen on this is that in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, this 40 percent reduction is a 10-year plan. I mean, this is by 2025. Yeah. We are putting things in place right now that have to address the human health aspect, meaning wastewater treatment. Let's get those yeah. toxins out of the water now. But, you know, again, it, it comes back to the fact that <coughs> just to regulate to regulate, you know, you're going to put bad policies. There are so many great things going on right now, and I can truly say this, that we need to allow that to run its course. When we surveyed the farmers, 85% of those farmers recognize what they do on their land impacts the lake. 85% of those farmers are willing to make a change. We just need the scientists to inform what that change is, and it's not there yet. On the CAFOS thing, too, we have research going on right now that's what's called phosphorus fingerprinting. So here, within a year, maybe a little less than that, when you measure that phosphorus, it's not just, oh, phosphorus is there, but did it come from a wastewater treatment plant? Did it come from a tile drainage? Did it come from pork, uh, hogs, chickens? So all that's coming. Um, so it's in the in, in the room. And, and so really, I think we need to let this process kind of run. As long as there's human health that's being protected along the way, the research kind of has to inform that policy. You can't just be writing and regulating policy that aren't. Can I just say one more thing? You have a guest speaker. I, I, oh, I don't want to talk about you over time. Because it, it's an interesting topic and one that we get asked about a lot. And we have to be somewhat careful you know, with our answers. But I look at it in the same way I look at gaining weight. Really easy to gain weight, really hard to lose. It's the same thing in Lake Erie. These, what we have done and our actions in increasing nutrient loads have taken a long time to get to where we are now. We can't expect a quick fix. There is no diet pill for Lake Erie. It's going to be a long process. And not that it's an impossible process, and there are ways that we are trying to speed up that process, um, and the science is improving to the point where we can start getting better data out to inform the policy. But it's not a short, there's no short-term solution. The best we can do is increase our monitoring efforts and be able to protect public health and um, ecosystem health to the degree that we can until we can put those regulations in place to look at a nutrient uh, reduction and a watershed improvement. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Tim.
right, so evening, everybody. Um, uh, this is incredibly informal. So everyone relax. Thursday night, everyone's tired. Um, it's late in the day, so we're going to keep this informal. Hopefully, keep this kind of fun. Um, so a quick introduction. Uh, as Chris said, well, at first, I want to thank Chris. I want to thank Chris, and I want to thank all the the uh, show night people for having us here. Um, my family is here with me, and, and a family friend. So we're just very excited to be back on the island. We love this place. Um, and I'll get into some of those later, but thanks for having me today. This is really nice. So, quick introduction. And let me start out by saying, I mean, I'm, I'm 57 years old, and I'm looking at a lot of you that I anticipated probably about 40 years younger than I am. And I'm going to start out by giving you two pieces of advice um, that I hope whatever you do in your future careers as you go down the road, um, <coughs> stays with you. Worry less, number one, and two, have more fun. If I could go back and start all over with that as sort of a mantra, worry less and have more fun, I would do that. And anyone who's like me up there in age a little bit, would anyone agree with that in, in hindsight? Okay, so you're seeing it's not just me. Worry more, um, have less fun. So let me talk a little bit about, as Chris said, um, how I got started. Because I think where you are, you're probably getting ready to graduate from college, most of you. Um, and you may have all these questions about, you know, what am I going to do, and how am I going to make a living, and where am I going to end up? And at the same time, you're trying to figure out where you can professionally have all those personal issues about relationships and family. I mean, it's not easy to be that age. It's not easy to be any age, but it's not easy to be that age either. And you may be thinking, you know what, I should be looking on this straight line trajectory. I should know what I want to do. My path should be clear. I'm confused. I'm struggling. Why? I bet no one else ever worries about this. What did I say? Worry less have more fun. Let me tell you a little bit about me. So as Chris said, I started out um, when I was in college, I was really fascinated by soils. Because soils, um, to understand soils, you had to understand biology, geology, uh, physics, chemistry. And I really liked that, my, my professors would have hated this word, but the mishmash um, of knowledge that you had to understand to be a decent soil scientist. I really liked that. Um, graduated from Ohio State in 1981. Um, went and worked for the federal government, the National the um, Soil Conservation Service, now it's the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I was a soil mapper. Did it for a year, and I'll be honest, I was really bored. <laughs> I was really bored. I would be out in the field all day long. I had my soil bore and big soil samples, and that, that looks about like the last 400 soil samples. <laughs> so after a year, I just decided this is not what I want to do. So lesson one there is, like, if I'm not sure what I want to do, what if, don't worry, don't worry, I'm going to figure it out. So I decided, eh, I don't really want to do this, um, but I still really like soil, so um, I did what many young people do who are sort of unsure of the direction. I went to graduate school um, <laughs> and absolutely loved it because as opposed to undergrad, I was in graduate school, I was studying what I wanted to study, I was with people who also wanted to study what I wanted to study. Um, I was out in Nebraska, and if you want to study soil, there is a lot of soil in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was just an absolute, yeah. My favorite educational experience was graduate school. I just loved it. Um, so I'm in graduate school. Oh, the other thing that was great about it was I was like 20, I don't know, 22, 20, I don't remember how old I was, but in my early 20s. Uh, so, you know, you're young, you're having fun, you got energy, everything's exciting. It, it was just a blast. Worry less, have more fun. So I always thought, I'm going to go get a PhD. So I'm going to go get my doctorate. Um, that sounds like the right thing to do. That's what most people who are getting their master's tend to do, tend to do something like that. Well, talking to some of my professors, I thought, okay, if I do that, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to end up probably teaching Soils 101, you know, the land grant university somewhere, which would be okay. Um, then I'd be writing uh, papers that not a whole lot of people would read. And I, the more I started thinking about it, yeah, I'm not sure I really want to do that. Um, well, right around the same time I was having these thoughts, at the University of Nebraska, the way it works is, so there's the downtown campus, and then there's the, what they call the ag campus. Well, the ag campus, where I went, is also where the law school was. So in the morning on my bus ride, because I had you no know, campus bus, I would get on campus bus, there would be all these law students, and I would talk to them, and they were talking about this thing called environmental law. Well, oh, what's that? That sounds kind of cool. Oh, really? That's interesting. So I did a little research, not much, I was 23 years old. Yeah, that's not cool, I think I'll do that. So I went to law school, um, decided I really don't want to go on and get my doctorate. I, I think this environmental law sounds really interesting. 
And I'll be honest, watching Tim talk, I realized I had gone about as far as I could um, in my career with the mathematics efficiency that I had. I had <laughs> faced it for long enough, but I realized that if I tried to go any further, I would totally be faking it. But words, I was pretty good at. I was always better at words than numbers. Um, Tim's talk, I was good for about the first half. As soon as he got into the omics with the, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> so things haven't changed much in 40 years. So I went to law school, um, graduated from law school, um, and from then on, I was a trial lawyer. I worked for the Ohio Attorney General's office doing environmental enforcement. Um, I did that for eight years. I sued all kinds of, I sued just about every company in Ohio. I, I, it got to the point my wife dropped down the highway. Every time a truck would go by with a big corporate name on it, I would go, yeah, I sued them. I did that for eight years. After a while, frankly, one case started to look like every other. That's okay. And again, what, what I'm telling you here is don't think of this linear trajectory where you finally find the perfect thing and you stay there forever because that is becoming more and more the exception rather than the rule. So don't let that scare you. Don't let change scare you. So eight years of that, um, I had the opportunity then to go work for Honda. Honda? What was going on? Honda? Honda needed a lawyer to help them with their environmental compliance counseling. Um, most of my practice was focused on air, air pollution control. Honda, their biggest environmental issue was air pollution because they, cars. they and what do they do to the cars? They paint cars. And when you paint cars, all that solvent goes up the stack. They had gotten in some trouble for not controlling their solvents very well. They decided they needed a lawyer. So I went out and spent 11 years, believe it or not, working for Honda. So again, change. Don't be afraid of it. Have fun. Worry less. I wish I could tell you that I lived that rule all during my career. I did not. I was telling you now, I worried a lot. I didn't have as much fun as I, in hindsight, should have had. But I still like being a lawyer. I loved it. So I'm back along at Honda, say everything's great, and then in 2006 there was an election and a guy named Ted Strickland won, a Democrat, and I'm not a very political guy. I don't get actively involved in politics, I tend to keep my politics to myself, um, but I got a call asking if I would be interested in being the director of Ohio EPA under the administration. If you've been doing environmental law for a long time and you get the chance to do that, you don't say no. I'm like, yeah, this is great. And frankly, at Honda, I kind of had everything buttoned up. I felt like every day was starting to look like, okay, you know, going to work, making a donut. So this came up. <laughs> this came up, and I'm like, okay, I got to do this. So I did it for four years. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, great job, great staff, great people, lots of challenges. What happens when you tag on with a politician for your career? <laughs> what happens if your politician doesn't win? <laughs> All right. So, hey, that's what happened. So, looked around, and there was this incredible opening at something called the Great Lakes National Program Office at USDA Region 5. And I said, you know, that sounds really interesting. Um, and I applied for it, and I ended up there. I'm now the director of the Great Lakes National Program Office. I've been doing it for almost exactly five years, and it's been challenging for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, um, but it's also been a lot of fun. <coughs> so the point there, um, have fun. Don't worry. Do not be fearful that you feel like I'm not in a straight line. These things aren't going the way I thought they would. I thought I would love this job. I really hate this job. Um, let me give you another rule for the road that has served me very well. Um, as you work down your career. Your, I'll just say this very bluntly. Your job, in my view, is allowed to suck two days a week. If your job sucks three days a week, you've got to find something else to do. Because no matter what your job is, and no matter how, now, so let me ask, people who work in the world, is anyone else, would anyone else agree with that? Yeah, not everyone, okay, I'm seeing a couple of hands. No matter how great your job is, no matter how much you love it, no matter how much the substance of the work is just right up your alley, there's always, in my mind, been a difference between the job and the work. The work may be what you absolutely love, but there's also the job, which means there are things you're going to have to do that aren't terribly interesting. It could be personnel issues you have to deal with, difficult personnel issues that you may have to deal with. 
timekeeper. It may be um, the way you would, your office is administratively administered, hirings, promotions, all that sort of stuff. But if you really like what you do and if you go home excited three days a week, you're doing really well. Um, you're allowed to hate your job once in a while. That's okay. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's been on 7 7 every day of their career. I've heard about them. I know they're out there somewhere. I've never met anybody like that, but I have heard about them. So, again, have a lot of fun. It's just really exciting to see you folks getting ready to get started. I can't even imagine the kind of, assuming you're going to the environmental or you know, scientific fields related to environmental protection, um, I can't even imagine some of the problems that you're going to be faced with. I do know there will be big ones. I do know they will be extremely challenging. I do know that they require your knowledge, skills, intelligence, and experience. Um, the world really needs you. You may not know that right now, but it does. And you will figure that out. Just find out what you like to do. Stay true to it. Work really, really hard. I'm a big believer that work makes luck. Some people say, wow, you know, hard work brings good luck. It's true. It really is true. Work hard, and believe me, in 10 years, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. You'll be doing this. And all these problems, climate change, the lakes, et cetera, you're going to be the one for managing the program and addressing those issues and doing it fine. So get ready, because it's coming fast and furious. Before you know it, you're going to be up here talking to people. Now, let me talk about what I really want to talk about. But I thought, you know, I wanted to kick off with, uh, with something light. Tim just talked about molecules. I mean, he was down at the scientific level. He, you know, the little single-celled creatures, diatoms, um, antibana, microscopes, et cetera. Now, we're going to change the scale a little bit. There's the Great Lakes. Roughly 300,000 square miles, if I remember correctly. Home to about 35 to 40 million people on both sides of the border. Um, they are an ecological marvel. They are an aesthetic marvel. They are an economic marvel. Um, they are a marvel in just about any way you can think of. You all know 20% of the world's fresh water right there. Um, it is an unbelievable resource, and it's only going to become more and more valuable as time goes on. How do you manage this? How do you manage a single cell? How do you study a single cell? How do you study this? It's not easy. As I mean, we, we talked that out a lot. It is complicated. You know that. But what I want to talk about, and like I said, I'm going to take too much of your time this evening. I want to talk about two tools that we're using to try to manage not a lake, not a, not a western basin, not a small portion, but this whole area. How in the world do you do that? It's not easy. And you need a couple of things. I never give a talk without asking this question. Whenever you're dealing with solving an environmental protection problem, cleaning something up, restoring something, protecting something, there are two questions <coughs> that ultimately become foremost. Two questions that ultimately every issue boils down to. Who looks engaged, smart, effective? You do. What are the two questions? What are the, what are the two things that all these issues boil down? Two things you have to ask yourself. We got you. No. My opinion is talking. That's a great question. Me? No, not you. I already know you know the answer. In the straight shirt. Two punches. The title of this talk is Two Punches. 
two-punch approach. The first one is, Chris talked about it already, the GLRI. First clue is any acronym that begins with the letters GL <laughs> probably relates to the Great Lakes. That's a good assumption. Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. What is that? You know what that is? It's a lot of things. It's a tremendous amount of work. It's a lot of great people working very hard, working together. But ultimately what it is, is it's money. It's money. The GLRI started in uh, 2009-2010 timeframe under the Obama administration. Let me put it in these terms. The budget of the Great Lakes National Program Office in 2009 was about $50 million. That's a lot of money. The budget of that office one year later was $475 million. That's a big increase. That's an increase of, a, of an order of magnitude, which means you have to completely rethink how you do things, what you do, what do your people do, how do you organize your people, how do you deal with that kind of change, and how do you deal with that much money? Well, why? Where did this money come from? Because the President and Congress decided that it was time to put serious money, if you will, into Great Lakes restoration. So that first year was $475 million. It spent roughly $300 million every year since then. Even by today's crazy standards, $300 million is a lot of money. And you can do a lot with $300 million, let me tell you. What do we do with that money? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a two-minute overview of how the GLRI works. Before I do that, let me preface this. If you're at all interested in how this works, where the money goes, what is this crazy thing, there's a really great website called glri.us. Just go there and all things shall be revealed. Um, <laughs> most importantly, um, what you'll find on that website is there's an actual description and a lot of information about the roughly 3,000 projects that the GLRI has funded across this entire basin from Minnesota all the way over <coughs> to eastern New York. It fits in the Great Lakes Basin. And frankly, there are some things outside the Great Lakes Basin that we've also funded. Biggest example, why would we be spending money in the Mississippi Basin south of Lake Michigan? It's not the Great Lakes Basin. Who cares what's in south of Lake Michigan? Asian carp? Spending a lot of money to try to keep the carp out. That's where a lot of that money goes. We have five focus areas, five things that we focus on. One is cleaning up really contaminated areas called areas of concern. They were identified back in 1987 pursuant to that particular issue of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, now, they were identified by the U.S. and Canada jointly, and what they are is they represent cities, essentially cities that had huge legacy contamination problems um, left over from going back as far as the late 1800s. Old paper, you know, contamination from paper production, steel, chemicals, a lot of contaminated sediment, a lot of degraded habitat. Um, a quick success story between 1987 and 2010, you know how many of those AOCs were cleaned up in the U.S. and actually taken off that list? One. That's between 1987 and 2010. That's a long time. Since then, you know how many we've cleaned up? Eight. Why? How? We had money. We also deal with invasive species. The Asian carp is pressing from down here. Um, we've got hydrilla, we've got uh, dreissenids, phragmite, the all-time favorite. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with invasive species, Asian carp. Focus area three is what we call the near shore. That is where we try to deal with nutrients. Um, I think the, the colloquy that you had with Tim about nutrients and is non-point source, that's pretty much what I was going to talk about. You've already done that for me. That was great. So thank you. Um, and we can't talk about the dredging you know, during questions. I can talk about that in flight. Um, we also deal with habitat. We spend a lot of money restoring habitat. Right now, we're especially focusing on trying to restore coastal wetlands. We've lost a lot of the coastal wetlands in the Great Lakes Basin over the last number of uh, centuries. We're now putting millions of dollars in trying to restore them. And the last focus area we call Focus Area 5 because it's a catch-all. Well, that's not true, but it, it includes a lot of things, including education, um, including climate change, and including some other things. But the bulk of the work goes into really areas of concern, invasive species, habitat, and the near shore. The way it works, 
Congress appropriates money. It comes directly to EPA. EPA is not doing this single-handedly. We have 15 federal partners, 15 federal agencies, including NOAA, including USGS, the Army Corps of Engineers, Soil Conservation, I'm sorry, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. So 16 federal agencies who work very closely together and argue sometimes about how to prioritize that money. And this happens on an annual basis. These agencies get together and come up with a budget, prioritizing the work that they think needs to be prioritized, and then the money goes. What do we do with it? Money, the money can be used by an agency in-house. They can do their own work. We provide a lot of money in grants to states, to tribes, to academic institutions, to cities, um, to NGOs. Uh, we can do a lot of that. Um, a lot of our money at EPA goes to contractors. Well, what do they do? You know what they do? They do the dredging to clean up the AOC. Because most of the AOC, that area of concern related work, is cleaning up the contaminated stuff. Is there any AOCs in Ohio? Yeah. Mommy Bay, Cuyahoga River, Ashtabula. Yeah. Ashtabula, we're almost done. Actually, we like to think the work is done. Now we just need to let it recover. Cuyahoga, we've got a ways to go. Mommy, we've got a ways to go for obvious reasons. Oh, and the Black River. But we're making good progress in the Black River in Lorraine. So the GLRI basically is a huge financial shot in the arm for environmental protection and restoration, and it's my job to oversee how that gets administered. So think about it. Let's go back to what I said a moment ago. I would love to be able to focus on the detailed issues of the similar because to me, that's really fascinating, and that's really rewarding to really get down to what's causing the problem, what's doing that. And boy, do we need good scientists like him, people like <coughs> Chris, uh, the other people here. We need people doing that work. I will never understand those issues at the level that they do. Nor should I. That's not what I should be doing. It's people like me who manage programs like this that just try to manage the overall program, try to understand what the problems, priorities, and make sure the money goes um, in the right direction and make sure the money is spent properly. Big part of what I do. Does that sound boring? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's really exciting. I would love to tell you that I go out and I'm shoveling the sediment out there and cleaning up those AOCs. I am not. You won't see me hack and frag my, I don't get to do that. But managing a program like this when you have money is wonderful. The other thing I'll point out, is congressional funding guaranteed every year? No. What could happen next year with the GLRI? Who knows? Our <coughs> motto is we live and die by Congress's largesse every year. Who knows what will happen? So that's a quick, a quick take on the money. Now let's talk about the management. If I'm not mistaken, you could draw a line just about bisect every one of those lakes because Who's responsible for the northern half of those lakes? Last time I checked, there's another country involved. When I first got to um, Gunpo, my federal job, I walked in, so excited, bright and bushy tailed, and my boss said, okay, your job is to go conclude the negotiations with Canada on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement revision. Mm -hmm. My thought was, I don't remember taking the treaty negotiations class in law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember doing that. I don't think I knew anything about this. And I didn't know anything about it, but it didn't matter. What you do is you stay in rooms, dark rooms, for long hours with your Canadian counterparts, and you're arguing over comma by comma, line by line. What does this mean? What does that mean? What are we trying to achieve? And you're negotiating with a sovereign government, um, and it takes a really long time, and you eat a lot of pizza, and you stay up late, and you try to get this done, and eventually we arrived at agreement, the 2012 version of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, um, which was a huge accomplishment because, like any international agreement, and, and let me be clear, this is not a treaty. Good question. What's the difference between a treaty and an agreement? This is that old one. What's that? Bingo. This did not have to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. It did have to be ratified by the Canadian Parliament, but on our side it did not have to be ratified by the Senate. So it could just be signed by the EPA Administrator, which it was in 2012. Canadian Parliament ratified it in February of 2013, um, and it's now been enforced for about three years. Now, what's been really exciting about this agreement, again, goes back to management. The whole point of having an agreement with Canada is simply to recognize neither party, neither Canada nor the U.S., can oversee these lakes in a vacuum. 
We have the same issues. I mean, the, the, the problems that are being caused in those lakes, the source issues, they're coming from all over the place. We've got a tremendous amount of phosphorus coming into the lakes here. Well, guess what? This is one of the most productive agricultural areas in Canada with a tremendous amount of phosphorus going this way and into Lake St. Clair and down the Detroit River and into the lake. So, again, that's just one example of we have to work together to do this. And what the agreement does, this water quality agreement, it provides a framework for allowing us to do that. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to manage. And it takes really good people. Just pause for a moment. So, yeah, my joke about the money. It's not a joke. It's absolutely true about, you know, how much and who pays. That's absolutely true. But you can't do anything. And I, everyone knows this already. Anyone who's ever worked on a, a group project in 10th grade knows this is true. <laughs> You can't get anything done without good people. You can't get anything done without good people and good staffers. Um, and boy, does it take good people to do this. And I'm very lucky to have great people at USDPA, and there are great people on the other side of the border. And what's happened since this new agreement was negotiated is it's built a lot of energy into the agreement that was lacking. I, I don't have time to go into the, the intricacies of the agreement. It covers 10 different areas, um, including things that are going to sound familiar, areas of concern, invasive species, nutrients. The one thing I do want to talk about, as was mentioned, um, Annex 4 of the agreement is, talks about nutrients, and within the last year, Canada and the U.S. very publicly announced that they had agreed under Annex 4 on uh, phosphorus reduction targets of 40%. Um, there was a lot of huzzah and a lot of, a lot of hurrah. But again, think of what was that again? They announced a target. Oh, that sounds like the work has to be done yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The work is just beginning. You're going to be hearing about things called domestic action plans. The Canadians will have one. We'll have one to figure out how do we reach that 40% reduction. And again, I think the conversation that you had shed some light on this. When we get to that 40% target, does that mean that our problem, if we can, I assume we can, I'd like to think we can, when we get to that 40%, does that mean that our problems with blooms are over? Yeah. No. No, 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 no. The, the underlying theory is it will, it will reduce the intensity and the frequency of blooms to a more palatable level, and one that we think is more akin to a natural environment. Now, a lot of people argue over what that means. But as was pointed out, the bacteria have been here, you know, literally, I think, since the Earth pool. There are many things that you can say that literally say since the Earth pool, but I think that's one of them, cyanobacteria. So it's not going away. It's a question of management. Again, it's quarter till nine. People are tired. It's been a long day. I'm not going to go on much longer. Um, I guess what I would, again, talking to the young people in the audience, as you think about where you're going and what you, what you want to do, what you want to take on, it can be anything from looking at something under a microscope. It can be everything from doing management of huge, multi-million. At this point, we've spent over $1.6 billion. So technically, I can say I administer a $1.6 billion program. <coughs> That's a lot of money involving thousands of people and hundreds of people. I don't get to look under a microscope much as I would like to someday, because, boy, did I like that when I was an undergrad. It wasn't math. I could just look at it. Um, but the thing is, whether it's the microscope, whether it's the management, whether it's your math skills, your people skills, we need you, and there's a place for you. So as you go down the road, don't sweat too much every single decision. Don't think you have to make the right decision every time to set you on that perfect career path. I've never heard of a perfect career path. Again, I'm sure somebody has found one. I haven't met that person, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere. But boy, do we need you. And with the problems that are coming, climate change is not, I mean, let's be clear, climate change is not a hoax. It's real, and it's here, and we're experiencing it. Um, it's not going to make these issues any easier. I do tend to agree with, I don't remember a book that came out a few years ago. Uh, it was called um, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Um, that was the author's summary of what the world's going to be like in the future. It's, it's going to be hotter. It's going to be flatter economically and sociologically. Um, and it's going to be hot. And I think 
that's true. And it's going to be crowded because there's more and more of us. Those problems are going to be yours, and we need your talents and everything you can bring. So I'm going to close, take some questions, talk about whatever you want to talk about. But please, you don't have to remember the rule about the how much and who pays, although I would encourage you to remember that. True. More importantly, remember worry less and have more fun. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Wants to go home. It's late. <laughs> go ahead. Is Canada putting in the same kind of dollars? No. Um, so for the last five years that I've been involved here, no. Now, the conjecture is that with the recent change in the Canadian federal government, um, that, that will change, uh, which is very possible. Um, and I hear talk that that's coming, but for the last five years, no. The federal government has not. There has not been parity between the two governments. Now, I have also been told there were times back in the 90s and the 80s where the Canadians were putting more money in than the U.S. was. So my guess is it's sort of a continuum. But for the last five years, um, the U.S. is financially, in terms of dollars, the U.S. has been the significant. That was actually the same question I had, but you kind of hit it. I'm mean, curious about the
worry about the sediments trapped behind the structure. Yep. Doing the chemical assessment. A lot of redundant dams and stuff. And, and we are, we, and when I say we, there are a lot of federal agencies working on taking a lot of those out. There's a project right now up in Michigan um, on the Kalamazoo River where there's exactly that situation where Superfund is involved. They know the dams have to come out. The dams are old. They're failing. They know at some point they're going to go. But they're also holding a lot of contaminated sediment in place. You know, so you first have to go in and clean that up. Then you can take the dam out. So again, it's hard. <laughs> but there's a lot of work underway doing that. Exactly. How many areas of concern are there? So originally, there were a total of 43, 31 in the US. Um, there have now been four delisted on the, I have to get my numbers right. Three have been, no, I'm sorry, four have been delisted on the US side, which means they've been cleaned up, recovery has been demonstrated, they're off the list. Canada's delisted three, I think. There are another four where we use this phrase called management actions have been completed. What that means is we think we've done all the work necessary, the dredging is done, the habitat has been restored but you have to do monitoring to show that it's actually recovered. Sort of like it takes a while for that particular system to become akin to everything around it, even after you pull the set of sprout. It takes a while for that habitat to establish. It takes a while for the concentrations of, of the chosen fish to come down to levels commensurate with other places in the lake. But in our view, as four others, we've done the work. Now we just have to do the monitoring, and eventually, hopefully the next few years, we can do this. What is the fair split between the United States and Canada? It's not a 50-50. In terms of number of AOCs? No, not, I'm changing back to the oh, oh, the money? Yeah, it's, I mean, we, we, we have a bigger population, but, you know, I mean, how do you, what, what do you think is a fair way to split up the expense? Well, I mean, the way it's split up is, if it's on the U.S. side, we pay for it. If it's on the Canadian side, they pay for it. Yeah. If, if there's money, it can, work gets done. If there isn't, it doesn't get done. It's, I mean, there is no mingling of money across borders for that kind of work. So right now, we're really surging on our AOC work, where the Canadian side, it's been a little slow. But it's safe to say that from the time period of like the 87 and now, how we had a big pulse where there was no delisting, Canada was delisting along that route, because they have a fewer number of AOCs than we do, but they right. are equal in the or close to being equal in the number that are yeah, they have a total of 12 AOCs, and I I think that's right. I think there's probably about three or four that have been delisted. Yeah. And there are shared AOCs, too, right? What we call binational AOCs. Yep. So we take care of our side of the river, they take their side of the river, and then we work to figure out who does what in the middle. So you have the same definition for finding an AOC? Um, we do for the same definition for defining an AOC. We don't always have the same criteria for determining um, what has to be done or how clean it has to be. So that gives rise to lots of interesting discussions about what has to be done in this particular AOC. And if they're, when they say they're finished, we look very carefully to say, well, yeah, we think they're finished enough that they won't have any negative impacts on our side. Vice versa. When we say we're done, they look to see if they agree that we're not going to have any further impacts on their side. And again, it was a very interesting discussion. But it works pretty well. It works pretty well. Now, I do, I mean, who doesn't love Canada? <laughs> you know, everybody loves Canada, and I certainly do. And it's just, it's, it's a very, it's just a great nation to work with. I do wish sometimes that they were, had the fiscal firepower that we do, but as I said, those days may be coming. We'll just have to see. Yes? I work about a stone's throw away from a pond that has hydrilla in it, and I just wondered about the breakdown of the shot in the arm the financial firepower um, to finance new positions for people to go and yank out and chop down those invasive species versus the money that's allocated for projects specifically. The money will be used for wetland restoration, but we won't include a coordinator for that wetland. We're just going to pay existing organizations to use their staff. And I hear a lot about jobs in this election cycle. Um, much of this money is paid. That's a tough question. Let me answer it like this. Some of the projects that come in, one of their selling points is we give extra credit for this. And, and I'm talking about how an EPA is evaluating grants. That looks like an NGO may submit a grant application to say, 
we're going to, let me describe my, because around here we see a lot more of that. And one of the things that they will often say is, we're going to use a um, use con uh, uh, civilian conservation court model, where they're going to bring in uh, unemployed people from the local area, they're going to train them, uh, give them a certain amount of training, and they're going to guarantee a certain amount of work that works. They get extra points if they're doing that, and it's putting local people to work. Not every, not every application that is funded will do that. Um, sometimes an application will come in, and they're not paying anybody. They're volunteers that are going to do the work. And we'll vet it and just make sure, like, okay, are these people really going to be able to get this done on a volunteer basis? And if so, then we can fund that. So we do different things that happen different ways, but yes, there are a number of projects where employment is a component. Um, I can't tell you it's the most important component, but yes, we do look at that. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, um, not so much a question, but just something to sort of share with the group that not everybody here might know. I want to thank Glenco for actually managing all of this money because there are a number of people here that are direct recipients of that, of that funding and support. Um, <coughs> Andy and I are part of what's called the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, which is one of the major educational initiatives that's funded by the GLRI um, money. Where did that, that catch-all section five? Book Theory yeah. Five. Yeah, Book yeah. Theory Five. Um, so the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, through that and the GLRI funding that we have, is what allowed the educator course to happen up here, one of the factors. It provided a lot of the financial assistance for the folks to get up here, a lot of their resources, a lot of the experiences that we've been able to give them was all a direct result of GLRI funding that was allocated from the big grant and then we sort of manage it here in Ohio. And the other thing is the Limno Loan Program. And Andy has this book. Um, this is our traveling journal that goes with the Hydro Lab. So some of you may have seen in the earlier talk all the ponds that they're using to collect all the data. Well, the teachers this week have all been trained to use a Hydro Lab which is one of the very nice, sophisticated songs. And now that they're trained, they can all borrow that free of cost from EPA through a program, again, supported by GLRI funding that allows that to come out to teachers. They're trained. They use it with the students. We have a log in there that actually, it, it literally journals all of the places that this thing has traveled. We have a number of them, and that entire Luminal Loan program is through the GLRI funding. So I just wanted to, it's not, sometimes when you have however many billion dollars that you get to manage, you don't always get to see where it really trickles down to and where it makes an impact. And I'm going to pick on one of our speakers, um, Sherry, sorry, um, when she, in between, or after the first speaker, um, after Dr. Davis, she came over and said something to Andy and I that I think really hits home and demonstrates some of the impact and the effects of something like this. Can you sort of share a little bit of what you said? I thought it was so funny that um, this whole everything that we've learned about, um, all the vocabulary, you know, a sonda. I didn't know what a sonda was until, you know, I came here at the Hydro Lab or anything. So I feel like they front loaded all the vocabulary for us so that we could, you know, understand what was being talked about tonight. And it all made sense to, you know, the graphs. I'm a math person now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have done a better commercial. <laughs> so I, I, I need to point out, point that out. But also thank you because you know how I said, you know, like in the Tim's work where you're looking at the microscope and you're you're dealing with direct products. Very rewarding to be doing that, doing like that involved at that very detailed. How are we going to fix this problem level? You know how you just made my day and I told you are there joys in managing programs? That is the joy of managing a program like this, knowing that the money is actually getting out to people like you and doing what it's supposed to be doing, which a big part of it is the educational component. So that's why this is such a fun job. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Well, so I'd love to piggyback off of that because um, <laughs> as a scientific community, I think, as professors sitting around the room and as you can, we've done a disservice to that profession and the fact that we don't communicate what we learn 
the general public and to the stakeholders that need that information. And so anytime you can take an education, science education course, take it. Because if you think your job is going to be sitting in a lab with a lab coat on, just pipetting from one tube to the next, you've got to learn how to communicate what you're doing to people so that they understand it. And you see that through the, the grants process through GLRI and through EPA, because a lot of these grants that come in, it can't just be I'm going to do this study and my end result is going to be a publication in a scientific journal and I'm going to present at a regional conference. You need to also show the broader impact of that study and how you can educate and how you can inform stakeholders or even management and uh, decision makers, county commissioners and mayors. So science is really in that stage right now where we need to, as a community, figure out how to communicate that information to the general public. So I talked about how the money comes from Congress, all this money. That's true. But where does the money really come from? Uh, thank you. It's the taxpayers. One of the reasons that this, I kept talking about this AOC program, whenever you hear someone from Congress talk about the success of the GLRI, and it, it, it has bipartisan support, and it has support now from people it didn't have, from Congress people that weren't supporting it 10 years ago, or I'm sorry, five years ago, because they've seen what it, it can do for their communities. But the example that they always use, AOCs. You know why? Because you can explain what it means to clean up an area of concern and take a very polluted, and to, as we all know, highly polluted areas tend to also come with, with um, attributes like low income levels, poor education. It's an area where people don't want to go, business declines, et cetera. What happens when you clean up that waterfront area? All of a sudden, people can go there. They want to go there. Oh, what do businesses do? I think I'm going to open up a, 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 a bar there, a restaurant. You know what the city's going to do? We're going to make a park down by the river. You know the old stinky river that nobody used to want to go to? We're going to put a park there. <coughs> that sells itself because it's not just a story about environmental cleanup. It's a story about envir environmental and economic and community revitalization. And do the congressional people understand that? Oh, yes. Is it easy to convey to them why we're having trouble solving the harmful algal bloom problem? No, that's not easy to convey. And I think Tim's excellent presentation makes clear why. It's complicated, and there's a lot of unknowns. Well, the proverbial elevator talk, young folks, you know what an elevator talk is? That speech is okay. You've got 15 seconds to explain to somebody why it's important they spend this money. You can do that with AOCs. It's very difficult to do that, would have, except to say, we haven't solved it yet. We need more money to try to fix the problem. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, see if I can pull this up real quick, but uh, for next week, we have other guest speakers. The first one? No, July. Good. So, we have um, our research uh, lecturer will be. Uh, Chris Mayer from the University of Toledo will be coming up for us, and then also for our guest lecture will be um, the head of Ohio's uh, Nature Conservancy, Josh Knight. So if those of you that are staying on another week for another set of classes, great. Those of you that are leaving the island, sorry, come back again next year. But these are all, again, webcasts, and you can, you can listen to it from, from a home around the island. How many more? Uh, next week's the last week. That's when our summer courses end, and we get back to the field trip, and teaching 50 12th graders all fall on it. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Good luck for your finals on Saturday, and uh, enjoy the rest of your time on the island.